everyone. Respected learning delegates from across country and continent and varied academia, a very good evening to one and all. I am Jarashri Dave, your host for this webinar, and I welcome you all on behalf of Organizing Committee of Nanoland Limited. I thank you all for spending out your precious time and being a part of this international webinar organized by Nanoland Limited and co-organized by Xavier's Research Foundation, LD College of Engineering, US India Importers Council, US IIC, Youth Action for Environmental Management, Circulus, and ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad. This webinar is sponsored by It's Tomorrow News, MQA, Waze Major, Ranger, Equa, Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite, and IP support by HK India. Today, we gather to share our knowledge and ideas with our experts from diverse scientific field on learning, future of winters in the climate change era. So now moving forward, I would like to give a brief about our organizer, co-organizer and sponsors. Nanoland Limited. Nanoland Limited is an eminent research organization based in Ahmedabad, and we are mainly focused on climate change, clean energy, and sustainable development. We have a pool of research associates with diverse background affiliated with us who work day and night studying the various parameters of Earth and its components. Xavier's Research Foundation. The Xavier's Research Foundation Trust runs the Loyola Center for Research and Development, an autonomous institute which was established in the year 1987 in St. Xavier's College, Ahmedabad. Its goal is to do research in science and technology and the humanities. The center not only employs scientific staff dedicated to research, but also provides infrastructural support and expertise to the students working on frontline research field in environmental by microbiology and plant biotechnology. The mission of the center is to target grassroots communities on the fringes of our economy and through innovation, entrepreneurship, training and hand-holding setup production units at medium, small and micro levels. Youth Action for Environmental Management Youth Organization. Youth Action for Environmental Management, YAEM, is a youth organization based in the lecture district of Salima in Malawi, in Southern Africa. YAEM was formed in 2018 by a group of youth graduates passionate about bringing back to the community through sustainable environment management. The mission of the YAA, YAEM is to promote the development of the youth generation and rural communities that are substantially acquainted with and committed to the efforts of sustainably managing natural resources and the environment. Circulus. Circulus is a digital co community of leaders and innovators to accelerate circular economy along Latin America. They are virtual training platform on circular innovations through our Shepra network. A Shepra is an instructor or innovator with high class expertise in circular economy, sustainability, business and innovations area who introduce and guide beginners to his new paradigm of the cities, industries and transformation. LD College of Engineering. Lal Bay Dalpat Bay College of Engineering, Ahmedabad, is a premier government engineering institute in Gujarat, set with the objectives of imparting higher education, research, training in various fields of engineering and technology. The institute is affiliated with Gujarat Technological University, Ahmedabad and administered by the Department of Technical Education, Government of Gujarat. LD College of Engineering was established in 20 June 1948 as one of the first few engineering colleges in India. US IIC, US India Importers Council is a non-profit for initiative startup by the group of Indian SME, importers responsible for importers of over one $1 billion from USA. It is the only exclusive importers council in the world. USIIC acts as an intermediary organization to facilitate partnership and trade between Indian and American businesses, thus acting as a catalyst in promoting economic growth between US and India. Center for Excellence in Environment and Forest Laws, ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad. The ICFAI Law School Hyderabad, it's a significant segment of the ICFAI Foundation for Higher Education Hyderabad and is recognized by Bar Council of India. The ICFAI Law School Hyderabad offers BBA LLB honors, BA LLB honors, integrated five-year courses, one-year LLM in corporate and commercial laws and tax laws, and also PhD full-time, an eight-certificate course, ICFAI Law School Inventions, 
to develop a new cadre of professionals who will not only command a high level of domain proficiency, but also an integrate activities for developing scientific and technological solutions. Our sponsor, Wazemaker. Wazemaker Eco Private Limited is a prominent entity involved in manufacturing of its variant products like prominent electromagnetic water conditioner that helps in softening the water by removing ions that makes the water hard in most cases. This waste major water conditions comes with easy installation, consumes less power, and is easily customizable. It's Tomorrow News. It's Tomorrow News is an online weather news channel featuring new news mainly related to climate change, weather, and scientific documentaries. It hosts interviews, podcast, podcasts, and various eminent persons with scientific backgrounds. Rainzer M. Equa. Rainzer Equa is one of its experts in cleaning solar panels automatically using human efforts and thus increasing the efficiency of the solar panel by cleaning the dust and dirt with cost-effective technique. Mqua. Mqua is a product of Wismajor. Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite. The Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite is an active club of the Rotary Club international organization having played important role in various emerging issues and helps to find out the solution by serving the society. The club is actively working in various sectors, including environment, education, and women's healthcare development. This club has been serving it since 2010 with various prominent personalities from the city. And we thank and extend our full support to the Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite for their noble cause. Thank you, our organizer, co-organizer, and sponsors for felicitating this event. So now moving forward. Due to some health issues, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya would not able to participate in this webinar, but on his behalf, I request Mr. Omkar Acharya, Scientific Advisor at Nanoland Limited to welcome our delegates. Over to you, sir. A very good uh, evening, good morning, and good afternoon, because we have speakers and participants from, I guess, all around the globe. So, uh, in short, you can say um, a good day or a good evening to everyone. Greetings to one and all present here. I am extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to address you all. And I am thankful to each one of you for joining the international webinar on future of winters in the climate change era. I take pleasure to say that this webinar has been organized by Nanoland a prominent research organization in the field of climate change, renewable energy, biodiversity, and sustainable development. The organization felicitates such webinars to enlighten young minds and promote the participation of the general and scientific audience at all levels. I am compelled by all the speakers and experts from various parts of the world who took their time out and join today to be a part of this international webinar. We are honored to have you all with us. On behalf of Nanoland and its organizing committee, I feel proud in welcoming our elite speakers of this international webinar, who all are from different corners of the globe. The motive to organize today's international webinar is to learn the adverse effects of climate change on our shifting weather patterns. We have been experiencing drastic changes in our weather, weather patterns that have directly or indirectly impacted us and our biodiversity as well. Through our experts, we will learn the ways uh, to mitigate climate change and new adaptation techniques. I would not take a lot of your time and uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity and uh, I feel privileged to introduce our eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Bharat Maitre, who is also my guide for my PhD right now. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Mr. Uh, Thokozani from Malawi, uh, we would like to welcome you as well. Dr. Alina, she's from London and we would uh, like to welcome her as well. Professor Dr. Suhas, uh, who is the uh, head of Department of Life Science uh, at Junagadh? We would like to welcome you, sir, as well. Mr. Mauricio, who is from the other side of the globe for India and Colombia. So we would like to welcome you as well. Also, 
I would like to thank Xavier's Research Foundation, uh, LD College of Engineering, USIIC, YAEM, Circulus, ISFAI Law College for co-organizing this event. I also would like to welcome the representatives from its Tomorrow News, MQA, Wazemasher, Ranger, and Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Land. And also all the participants who are who has joined us to today to gain some knowledge on climate change and its impacts. And last but not the least, I would also like to welcome representatives from uh, HK India for providing their IP support. Thank you. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Thank you very much, sir. So let's move forward. May I please welcome once again our dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Bharat Maitreya, Professor, Department of Botany, Bioinformatics and Climate Change, Gujarat University. Mr. Tokozani Mashare, Co-Founder and Programs Coordinator at Youth Action for Environmental Management, Malawi. Dr. Alina Congreve, Associate at Local Government Information Unit, London. Professor Dr. Suhas Vyas, Professor and Head, Department of Life Science, Bhakti Kavi Narsi Mehta University, Junagar, and Mr. Mauricio Zanteno Casas, co founder and circular innovation director, Circulus Mexico and Colombia. Let's move forward with our next speaker, Dr. Alina Congreve. Dr. Alina Congreve is an associate at Local Government Information Unit, London. She is an experienced built environment and climate change professional with 18 years experience working in higher education, public policy and innovation. Her main spe specialties are placemaking and spatial planning city scale mitigations and adaptation to climate change. Low and zero carbon building ecosystem services and natural capital design and delivery of professional and higher education programs. She has undertaken a broad range of applied research projects working for think tanks, professional bodies and membership organization. So now I request her to present her views with us. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you for that, that kind introduction and, and, and sorry to our participants for some of the technical issues we're experiencing this morning. It's great to get views from so many people all around the world, but that sometimes means that the, the internet isn't always with us. So um, hopefully we'll be able to, to resolve those problems. And sometimes I find it helps if I sit right next to my box. So that's why I'm in my living room at the moment, sitting right next to my internet box. So hopefully you'll you'll all be able to, to hear me um, okay. But do put a little note in, in the chat if there are any problems and I'll we'll, we'll try and resolve those but hopefully everyone can hear me okay <laughs> so um, I'm going to start um, sharing my screen now and have a, a short presentation yes good thank you um, a short presentation to share with some some insights from us here in London so just sharing my screen now So, um, as, um, as I was introduced, I work for an organisation called the Local Government Information Unit, and that's a membership organisation for local authorities based here, city councils, based here in the UK, also in the Republic of Ireland, and more recently in Australia. And it's there to provide people working in, in city governments with insights and expertise and briefings that they can use to help inform their work. They're often very busy people and don't have the time to go and read academic papers and read academic research. But it's very important that their work is informed by the latest thinking. So my role there is to take that academic research and those briefings and to put them in a short and digestible format so people who are busy working city councils can engage with that material. And I've been asked to speak today to, to share some research I was doing this time last year putting together some of that information for city councils about how we respond to winter, particularly how we respond to winter in an era of COVID and an era of climate change. And that's what I'll be sharing with you in the next, next 15, 15, 16 minutes. Um, so, um, oh, I'll just get rid of that. Oh, at the top, that's something to annoy me. Um, so, um, we've seen in the past year an unprecedented level of disruption. So COVID around the world has changed so many things about how we live our lives, 
how we interact with our families, how we work, how we socialize, and also how we, we care for one another. And in many ways that perhaps prefigures the much greater disruption we will be experiencing in future with climate change. So the kind of changes we, we've all had to make um, over the past 18 months are, are perhaps quite modest compared to the kind of disruption and changes to our lives we'll be experiencing in future with climate change. And it's posed a real challenge for, for many of us in, in how, we, how we make those changes and, and how, we, how we respond. Um, one of the, the, the key changes we, we've seen here where, where I, I live in, in England is changes to how we work and, and how we meet our friends. So it has become much less common for us to commute into a city centre. So to get on, on public transport, on, on underground trains and on the main railways, to travel 20 or 30 miles to city centre, to work in an office and to come back again. It's become much more common for us to work at home as I am today, but also the recognition that working at home can be quite isolating. It's not good for collaboration. And the idea that as well as working at home, we could work, um, at, at hubs that are closer to perhaps where we live. So in, in local centers, local shopping centers, local high streets, rather than us all traveling to a city center many miles away, we can go and, and meet colleagues, use IT facilities, um, collaborate in more local shared workspaces. And these could be combined with other services that we can perhaps pick up, uh, click and collect um, online orders. Um, we can, can hire transport, we can buy coffee, we can use other services. And perhaps occasionally, perhaps once a week or once or twice a month, we might travel into the city center. But this, this is very much a change from, from how we've been living before where many of our areas around our cities became effectively dormitories. People were sleeping in them, but they weren't using those servers actively. They weren't buying a coffee. They weren't using local shops as much. And that's been a, a big change we've seen over the last 18 months. And many um, towns and have also responded to these local centers by um, changing their public realm. So many streets that had traffic on them have become pedestrianized and restaurants and cafes have spilled out over onto those streets. Um, traffic has been either reduced or even prohibited from going down some of those streets and those COVID street closures are still with us, as well as making more vibrant places for people to, to shop and to meet friends and to, to use hospitality businesses like cafes. There's also brought improvements in air quality. So with these streets now not having traffic in them, they're, they're a great improvement in terms of, of local air quality. And indirectly, I guess, the reduced traffic also helps our, our transport related climate change emissions as well. Um, and creating much more pleasant places. So as well as being a nice place to sit, a nice place to meet your friend, some of these measures can also be good for, for adaptation to climate change and creating environments that are, are greener and more pleasant and better adapted, having, having more greenery in them and reducing perhaps urban overheating risks. This all looks lovely in the summer, <laughs> so that the pictures here were taken in, in May and June. But how does that work the rest of the year, particularly in the, the winters that we experience in, in Northern and Western Europe, and indeed in North America? Um, so the picture on the left is from an advent calendar where you open a door every day and that's perhaps, I guess, a, a preconception of what London is like in the winter, um, with lots of snow and twinkly trees and lights. The picture on the left is perhaps a little more common of what London is like in the winter, that it's quite grey and quite cold and wet and it rains a lot. And often my experiences of going to London in winter are more like the picture on the left, unfortunately, than the picture on the right, that the, the lovely twinkly snow in London is perhaps more a thing of of children's stories and of novels by Dickens, rather than our everyday lived experience of what, what winter is like in London. And we're perhaps less enthusiastic about meeting friends outdoors and doing things outdoors in, in the winter months. Um, and just for showing some of these Met Office slides that um, certainly when I was growing up as a child in London, we would have perhaps three or four significant snowfalls a year. That snow would last for three or four days. Um, I used to enjoy walking to school in the snow, it was quite exciting. <laughs> um, that's not something we're going to see in the future. So this map of our climate in, in 2040 shows 
that um, we may not get any days below freezing at all in London and that, that children growing up then won't have that experience of, of playing in the snow, of, of, of walking to school in the snow. And we're, we're not alone in this. So friends and colleagues who work in, um, in Scandinavia, um, they're also seeing much less common snowfalls and more just mud and slush and wet. <laughs> so their, their winter climate is changing as well to be, be milder and also to be, to be wetter. Um, so that's, that's what, what our, our winter climate projections have in store for us. Um, so how do we respond to this? How do we, how do we stop winter being something we dread, something we dislike, moving towards being something that we, we perhaps live with and even enjoy? And uh, last year, a, a researcher called Carrie Leibowitz, she moved from uh, a warm and sunny place in the US um, to one of the most northerly cities in Europe. So she moved to a city called Tromso, that's um, around the Arctic. And um, she was quite scared about this move. So she was moving from a city where she used to daylight and sunshine all year to a city that in the winter, so from November, middle of November to the middle of January, there is no sunlight at all. <laughs> there is a kind of half light for a couple of hours or there are also the Northern lights in the sky, but there is no direct sunlight at all. Um, and as a health researcher, she, she was both afraid, but also curious about this and how this would work. And she was very surprised to find that her experience interacting with her, her new neighbors and her new colleagues was that people were not afraid of the winter. There was very low levels of anxiety and distress. And people who lived in Tromso enjoyed winter. They couldn't see what you wouldn't like about winter. And they, were, they also had a very positive attitude towards winter. And here we'd like to share a short poll with you um, to see what your attitudes are towards winter. So um, I'd be grateful if the organizers could launch the poll now and we can get your views on winter. So um, perhaps if we could have the poll started, that would be great. So yes, developing a winter mindset. And it is really interesting to see that um, from her research, that residents who lived in more Northern cities like Tromso had an even more positive attitude towards winter than those who were um, a few degrees South, people who lived in Oslo. So it's in the, the further North you were and the more winter you had, the more positive people were around it. So um, moving swiftly on, because I'm aware we've got a, a busy program um, today. Um, there are things you can do as an individual, so your own psychology and how you respond to winter, but there are also things that, um, that can help you with that, so to help you feel more positive about it by the kind of infrastructure that's around you. So um, we've seen many hospitality businesses here um, responding to people's desire to keep socialising out of doors and meeting their friends out of doors, which from a public health perspective is much safer than meeting your friends indoors and putting new facilities in place, whether that's a, a small local business, putting in these, these cabins here um, so people can meet, meet friends and family outdoors. Through to this much more elaborate case here, which is at Somerset House um, in central London, where there are all these little igloos where people can, can socialize and again, again meet their friends in a, a safer setting than in a, in a crowded restaurant. There have been some barriers to businesses putting even more of these measures in place because there's uncertainty over planning, that we're not sure how long the current public health crisis will last. And if they do invest in these kinds of structures, whether they can um, keep that investment going forward. So whether that is something they'll be, be allowed to keep. Um, there are also some concerns about some of these measures. So um, the example bottom right, the, the outdoor heaters, <laughs> relates again back to our concern about climate change. So um, should we really be heating the outdoors and, and what the impacts are, particularly of, of, of gas heaters out of doors? And, it's, and some cities are already starting to put limits on those. The city of Lyon in France is bringing in a ban next year to restaurants having outdoor heating. Um, because they've found that um, half a million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions a year come from Leon outdoor heating patio restaurant areas. So as we move to this kind of outdoor living, it's important we don't, we don't do things that in fact exacerbate climate change. More positively, some cities are bringing in guidance for, um, for outdoor businesses about how they can do this well without causing a significant environmental negative impact. So 
one of the municipalities within London, the city of Westminster, has produced a pack, a set of guides for restaurants about how they can do this without being damaging to the environment. So how they can thrive as an outdoor business without the need to have these, these patio heaters. Um, those, I guess, are, we're at quite an early stage with this in the UK. We're quite new to this winter planning. So for the briefing that I prepared last year, I was looking at other cities that are way ahead of us in terms of this. And no one has quite as much winter as Canada. <laughs> so Canadian cities have winter for many months of the year. And to um, make people feel positive about where they live and their well-being, but also to attract professionals to want to live and work in the cities. It's important for them that people like living in a city 12 months of the year and don't view five or six months of the year negatively and as an imposition. And even among Canada, the city that's a real leader in this is Edmonton. And Edmonton started its, its journey of winter planning um, over 10 years ago. It set up a special think tank called Winter City, and that brought together various ad hoc initiatives and festivals together under one overall winter planning umbrella. It carried out an in-depth public engagement exercise, and it carried out research all around the world to look at cities that were best practice in terms of their winter planning. And that culminated in 2016 with it producing what's called a winter design guide. And the point of this winter design guide was to provide all stakeholders, um, public bodies, planners, architects, designers, and businesses with guides for how they could proactively plan for winter. Just the example here shows um, a small cafe with outdoor seating. And the furniture here can be moved. So as the sun moves under the sky, you can move the furniture so um, your, your customers will always be sitting in the sun. Um, at more of a kind of neighborhood scale, this is what it looks like. So you're building in measures that protect customers from the wind, that use bright colors to keep it cheerful, that make um, use of lighting that scale for pedestrians, that develop a set of, of urban design principles so that the public realm and public spaces work for 12 months of the year and people are comfortable using them 12 months of the year rather than only working in the summer months. And this, this set of design principles then means that you, you don't need those patio heaters, as we saw in the last example, that, that people are, are comfortable and warm and cozy being outdoors all year. Of course, some of these measures are ones that need designing in from the start. So they're design principles when, when a project is going through master planning. But some things can be fitted in later. So things like tree arcades and awnings and canopies are things that um, can come in later and can be retrofitted into existing areas. And if we see what that, that looks like at a, at a street scale, the example on the left is from the urban design guide and about how you have shelter in your public transport and people are waiting to use it. You can encourage public transport by making it comfortable in the winter. Here are some of the awnings, people can still sit outside. And here is what it looks like in a real street. And you can see here the snow has been cleared from the street. So it's comfortable for, for pedestrians to walk and people can still comfortably enjoy using public transport in winter rather than jumping straight in their cars and the, the climate change emissions that brings. And similarly biking, that um, there isn't traditionally lots of cycling in Edmonton, but if, this, if the cycle lanes are well designed and they can be easily cleared of snow, then cycling can be something that people can do year round. If people can walk and cycle and use public transport, then that can dramatically help the city reduce its carbon emissions. So how does that work back in London then? What's our experience here? We're much earlier in our journey than Edmonton are, who've been really embracing this um, for the last um, 10 years. For us, it's something we've only been thinking about more seriously since the public health restrictions over COVID. The example I'm giving here is um, a place called Cadogan Estates in London. And this has been able to take this forward because it's owned by one landowner. So one landowner owns the public spaces, the public realm, and is also the landlord of the buildings. So they're much more able to bring about change than when ownership is more fragmented. So they've introduced over a hundred more seats in the public realm. So people can easily buy, buy a hot drink and sit down comfortably. They've also been working with restaurants about um, how they produce cover to protect from, from rain. They did think about more permanent covers, things like glass to cover some of the dining areas, but they quickly discarded that because they thought it would create more of a shopping mall type feel <laughs> rather than an outdoor feel. 
And they've noticed that the public are really willing to, to go along with this. The public are dressing for the occasion, they're wearing winter clothes, but they also, the restaurants often also provide them with blankets as well, so they, they can wrap up a bit more there too. It's been great for businesses. So many of the restaurants that had smaller indoor dining spaces have been able to expand. And in the total area, it's added over 500 seats um, to the capacity of many restaurants. It's also created spaces where the public can meet and enjoy meeting their friends out of doors in the winter and activities too. So curling, where you throw bits of um, <laughs> things across the ice and they hit a, a jack at the end. That's not really a sport we do much here, but it's been one that people can, can engage with actively out of doors. Finally, they're looking at temporary structures. So um, rather than building lots of permanent things about how you can have temporary buildings that can be flexibly brought out at certain times of year, used more creatively, and how our, our planning rules can, can help facilitate that to, to allow more temporary interventions in the built environment for the winter months. So thank you again for the opportunity to, um, to share some of my thoughts with you. I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing the other presentations this morning. Uh, do put any questions um, for me. I'll be, be happy to, to respond to those. And um, thank you again for your, your attention today. Thank you very much, Dr. Elena, for a, such a thought-provoking presentation. Uh, Ma'am, the question answer session will be at the end of the webinar. So let's moving forward to our next speaker, Mr. Thokozani Mashere. He is the co-founder and programs coordinator of Youth Action for Environmental Management, Malawi. He is an alumnus of Young African Leaders Initiative, Southern Africa 2020. He is also the co-founder and operations manager of Tafika Horticulture Enterprise and Services, a supplier of forestry and fruit tree seedlings and oyster mushroom. So now I request him to present his views with us. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Tobzan Machere from Malawi. Thank you so much for the privilege to be involved in this international webinar. Um, here um, uh, in Malawi, uh, we have uh, uh, a subtropic, uh, we have a subtropical climate in Malawi, uh, and climate change has really impacted a lot on on the winters here in Malawi, and we have really seen a rise in the temperatures in the winter here in Malawi, and a recent report uh, uh, analyzing the current uh, weather and climate in Malawi, which was which was uh, done by the university, uh, the Longo University of uh, the Longo University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, uh, and as well as the University of Leeds, reported that currently, well, Malawi has been experiencing a rise in temperature in the winters, and the, we are probably are going to experience uh, another rise uh, by at least two, two, two degrees Celsius in the uh, by, by the end of the century. So climate change is really impacting a lot on the winters uh, here in Malawi. And um, uh, if the government is not uh, and gov government and other stakeholders were not going to take part in addressing this issue, uh, it's really going to bring a lot of challenges to the uh, to the uh, to, to the country. Uh, the winters here in Malawi are really very important because, as you understand, some of the crops which you rely on here in Malawi, they, they do well in the winter. So if the winters are, from, usually here in Malawi, we, we experience the, the, the winters from around May up to August. Uh, and another thing is that due to climate change, there is, uh, there is a probability that uh, the, uh, the duration for the winters is going to be reduced, meaning that uh, probably we're going to be having a short winter with higher temperature on the development of the nation of Malawi and as well uh, on the welfare of people. And it's really, it's really important that we, we address this issue uh, urgently. And uh, I really look forward to the commitment of the government regarding all the pledges that the government had, uh, had made at the recent COP26 uh, in Glasgow. Uh, 
um, as I uh, actually uh, saw a mobile Scotland partnership as the year for the climate change. So I was privileged to be part of the the, the COP26 hub that uh, that was uh, that was following the the, the deliberation to the of in Glasgow, and I really look forward to. Uh, to seeing the government and stakeholders being really committed to the pledges that they made at the COP26. And as uh, a youth from, uh, as a co-founder of, of Youth Action for Environmental Management, uh, uh, we have a, we really have a unique approach in our addressing to climate change. Our unique approach is that we have noted that most of the uh, projects that uh, that are uh, addressing climate change, they, uh, they, they lack a concept of, uh, of promoting the people to have uh, uh, their own enterprises, which are climate friendly. I'll give an example. Most of the projects, they just go to, uh, most of the stakeholders, uh, NGOs, they just go to, to the rural areas, they tell the people to start to store things, and yet the people, they rely solely on the trees for their well-being. So it doesn't make sense, uh, as someone said, that uh, for you to effectively to effectively live a bad habit, you have to to replace that bad habit with a good habit first. So it's really difficult for the people to stop cutting trees when you are you are not showing them the way. So as an organ, as a youth organization, me and my colleagues, when we go out there to the rural communities to tell the people uh, to stop cutting the trees, we also uh, uh, help them to to learn some skills on climate climate friendly enterprises such as machine production. As the host has already said, that we're also into machine production. So uh, we promote the climate friendly enterprises such as uh, machine production, the setting of fruit seedlings, uh, so that the, they should be a smooth transition from the from the bad habits which are destroying the environment to the climate friendly enterprises and. The, uh, uh, with this unique approach, we're going to see more sustainable uh, projects. And our, uh, if you have more sustainable projects, it means we're also going to be able to effectively address the, the, the issue whereby the winters are really being challenged. So uh, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for for the, uh, for the for this privilege to express my views. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for giving your valuable insights. So let's move forward with our next speaker, Professor Dr. Suhas Vyas. He is the professor and head department of life science, Bhakti Kavi Narsi Mehta University, Junagadh. He has teaching and research experience of more than 15 years in the field of life science. He has published more than 40 research and reviews in national and international journals. Dr. Vyas has also published five books in international publications. He is also a member of Ecological Society of America, British Ecology Society and International Society of Chemical and Biology Science, Indian Botanical Society. So now I request him to present his views with us. Over to you, sir. Yes, just a moment. I'll just uh, share the screen. I think it's visible, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so good afternoon and good evening and good morning to all the participants and the panel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my views and share my thoughts regarding the climate change, uh, especially towards the uh, weather changes which is being going on throughout the globe. Uh, it's not the country, it's not the region, it's just the, throughout the whole different uh, parts of the world where this climate change is showing its role. So uh, thinking about that, I had just uh, chosen uh, the important uh, the uh, parameter which has which has been highlighted throughout the country for throughout the nation uh, of all the United Nations that have been signed the Paris Agreement, as we all know about that in 2015. So I have taken this particular carbon uh, as a climate change impact, which has changed every every sector. Maybe about the biodiversity, maybe all the all the uh, greenhouse gases, and all these have been changed due to the carbon. Now, what is the role of this carbon, and what has the impact? What it has impacted on several, and what are its measures 
that to be taken care of for uh, resolving or just mitigating this climate change that I am going to share in just a couple of uh, uh, minutes about 15 to 20 minutes I hope so so I think it's not changing the slide I'll just skip towards the uh, original view I'm not able to change the slide uh, just a moment Yes, no, I think it's changing. I hope it's visible, right? Uh, we are all thinking about uh, the meetings. We are all thinking about different uh, scenarios where we can disclose or we can aware about this global warming, sea level rise and extinction. But, but up till now, the measurements which is to be taken are in progress. We are looking at the goal. We are looking at the, at the target. But for achieving that target, that is a difficult task which we need to perform and it's the high time to perform that particular process through which we can we can mitigate the climate change that that part we have to understand so uh, in this particular presentation or in this short session i'll be discussing on the what is about the climate change and uh, what are the effects of the carbon which is playing its role in in the climate change and what are what are the solutions there are various types of solutions which we can prefer or which we can see in different types of reviews and literatures uh, I, have, I have i have mentioned over here only one important one which which can change the scenario for uh, help in the mitigation of the climate change i'll i'll talk about that later on uh, so climate change, as we all know, and uh, Elena and my co-colleagues all uh, have been referring this particular climate change. The important part over here is that scientific evidence for the warming is still being asked that is there any scientific evidence that there is a climate change or it has been throughout the the centuries it is still going on before the modernization or globalization but yes we have a number of evidences which proves that the warming situation that is global warming situation has arise through different uh, parameters like sea level rises as well as different temperature rises etc so that 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 strategy which is being published in different uh, literatures that i'll be sharing with you as I told you that there are evidences which are still being asked. The first evidence which we can see or which we can realize that the sea level rise throughout the uh, last, I mean, uh, 95 up till 2020 is being reflected in this particular graph. We can easily determine that, okay, this is the trend which is being going on. And if the Paris Agreement is not being followed, then it will shoot up like anything the per if you consider millimeter per year that is about 3.4 millimeter that sea level is rising if the current scenarios still persist then then it's very much sure that there should be uh, drastic changes in the weathers which we are talking about that may be summer that may be winter or that may be any of the monsoon or rainy seasons in the especially in the asian continents uh, the second one if you can see the gleb, the temperature rise right we are talking about the weather when winters but this winter, as uh, uh, my earlier co-speakers has referred, that the change in the winters are also being seen where there was snow, which was being considered to be more pleasant and more, 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 more uh, um, uh, fascinating. That has been changed into rainy seasons or, or in the precipitation in the form of water just due to the temperature rises. Right. We can see the the temperature rise has shoot up and the literatures have also been referred that it, it has increased up to one. 0.2 degrees celsius and if it is not being stopped or if 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 some some concrete steps are not being taken then it can go up to 2 degrees celsius as well so so there are there are uh, various types of of of, uh, of of things which are being going and adding or giving inputs towards the climate change out of which one of them is is the one one particular uh, slide which i have shown over here that is about the seasons extreme seasons now we can see that there were colds there were hot seasons also previously before the centuries but what is the change this change is being is being seen in in the site slightly shifting towards the the seasons because if we can see in this particular graph there were cold, but now we are experiencing that the, the, the duration of that cold is a little bit of less just due to the temperature variation, just due to the increase in the temperature, especially. So that has led 
towards more hotter part that is warming part that you that is just we call it as a global warming and and this particular thing has has impacted in 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 various other sectors also that may be spm uh, suspended particular matter that may be the loss of the biodiversity that may be changes in the phytoplankton zooplankton in the marine life or that may be leading towards the agricultural sector also so so that that has impacted that has indirect role of this this particular sea reasons on 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 uh, on the uh, other sectors due to the climate change we are very much familiar with the growing seasons right that growing seasons is is directly relevant towards the agriculture if we have if we have the 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 crops which generally grows in 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 the in the winter season which needs a, a good amount of winter that may be in the terms of duration if it is being decreased or or if the temperature is not being that much as it should be that has that can alter the the agricultural aspects also of that particular season now why this happens this happens that is the climate change or or the seasons are changing just due to one important factor that is the greenhouse gases and there are various greenhouse gases there is no time to talk about each and every one but just to consolidate all the greenhouse gases we can we can we can uh, share few of them or name few of them that is obviously carbon dioxide methane and the nitrous oxide the important one is the carbon dioxide or in terms of uh, we can say carbon that has that has increased incredibly in throughout the globe if you consider all the fossil fuels that the fossil fuels we are very much aware that this fossil fuel is nothing but the emission of the carbon now this emission of carbon has increased consistently has increased consistently throughout the about about 60 to 70 decades and this increase in the emission of the carbon has led towards the important a uh, important uh, what we call era but what i what uh, that is the climate change and this climate change is to be mitigated now the greenhouse gases is important in terms of mitigation or we should target the greenhouse gases where wherever uh, carbon is being present now we can see very much clearly that in the report of the ipcc that in 2014 maximum amount of of emission was nothing but the carbon in form of carbon dioxide that is to be mitigated or that is to be resolved now various resources which are being used which, what we call it as a non renewable resources that turns to go towards the fossil emission and that has lead increase in each and every uh, part now when we talk about effects as i have informed that uh, the carbon has emitted which has led towards the sea level rise and the uh, temperature rise which has led to three important criteria which has been showing its effect that is ocean land as well as the ice all these geographical uh, areas which has been shown in this particular slide that is warming throughout the world's ocean we know that the ice is also being breaking that it, that is uh, being widespread you are uh, increasing the rates of the global mean sea level ocean acidification that has given a huge effect of the climate change this ocean acidification has not only damaged the 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 life in the ocean that is the marine life but also it has not uh, it has not also impacted on the season as well land we know that there are various types of uh, uh, regions which has a, with different climatic zones right so this climatic zones have also altered for example if i can share with you that uh, rainy season was also there before before couple of uh, decades but that rainy season before 30 years or 40 years are we are still receiving the amount of that particular rain but the intensity the intensity of the rainfall per day has been changed and those times there was there was a rainy season which consisted about of about uh, about say about one month or more than one month two months right then in this particular time we can easily see that that per amount of rainfall that may be about 25 cm or 40 cm that has been shortened up during the duration time that is it is only just in 10 to 15 days it rains that much so the intensity of the rainfall has been changed a lot and which can 
can reflect in the in the in the effects of the climate change so precipitation has been changes in in each and every uh, season the ice also has been as i told you shrinking and your uh, average arctic ice has been uh, shown so uh, the the part which uh, major effects of uh, climate change is this particular carbon it is not that much easy to to uh, reduce the carbon at one stroke itself but there are there there should be a, a continuous process or there should be continuous steps which it should, which it should be taken for just mitigating because other, or else the the net, the generations will will not be able to see this particular time or this particular uh, uh, time which we are able to see uh, it has been predicted in the paris agreement uh, as this particular slide shows it has been very much predicted that if we emit the carbon in at this particular range which is being emitted in this era ha, will will have a greater impact if it is changing the temperature due with the help of uh, 1.5 degrees celsius it will change that is it will increase the temperature in this that means we are talking about or we are we are planning to go for carbon sequester that is carbon footprints in terms of that is whatever carbon is being emitted by that particular country that have to that have to pay the penalty or that have to mitigate the carbon in one or the other form but that may be in terms of financial conditions right but that is is that the solution uh, the solution of this carbon which is to be stopped or it is to be mitigated one important solution which is to be taken into consideration that is the coastal blueprint that is about the about the carbon especially now carbon can be sequestered or carbon can be captured maximum maximum throughout the literature which is showing that is about the coastal blue carbon which we which we term as a blue carbon now the coastal zones of 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 all the countries if you can imagine that the, those coastal zones have have one or the other type of diversity right especially the plant diversity now that particular diversity have important key role to sequester or to capture the carbon in this this slide you can easily interpret that investing in the coastal in terms of plant diversity in three different forms uh, pl uh, coastal plants obviously have different varieties of habitats right maybe a marshy habitat maybe a sandy habitat or a rocky habitat there may be different habitats in the coastal regions but this coastal regions that that having a marshy or or uh, slightly marshy that can sequester carbon maximum globally about 284 to 233 million tons of carbon can be sequestered every year by coastal wetlands we can imagine it that means it is it is 10 times greater than that of the terrestrial forests right so uh, that obviously has a greater impact in capturing the carbon and can and can streamlining not exactly the streamlining but that can help towards the capturing of the carbon which is the important one now in in little bit of detail little bit of detail if we can if we can see the variations of uh, of uh, capturing the carbon to just help in the in the climate change mitigation this coastal ecosystem have a major role to play now if we promote this coastal ecosystem or if we promote or uh, to do something about about uh, the restoring or to rehabilitating the the coastal flora especially it can help to a greater context for mitigating this carbon uh, climate change if you you can the slide easily can be interpreted that the last three points that is tidal salt marshes mangrove areas as well as sea grasses in the coastal zones have a, a, a large impact of sequestering the carbon and and not only double or treble but it has more than 10 times of impact which can be which can be easily being uh, capturing the carbon on on the in the from that especially from the atmosphere and there are different ways also that means that means by the plant itself and the soil which can help the the to sequester the carbon now uh, i think this particular slide is showing that that what what type of 
plants can be can be done for sequestering the carbon which is still being pending for for the future to to capture the carbon through this uh, blue carbon and resources to mitigate the carbon now one thing can be done this is the form of a solution type we can just analyze these things that the, the mangroves the salt marshes as well as the sea grasses first of all can be extended that means they they can be calculated that what is their what is the current scenario how much carbon is can be can be captured by each and every individual species that is individual type of species present on the coastal areas and monitoring of course that three important task is to be is to be uh, searched or is to be researched in terms of data collection etc number two that may be count out the emissions for healthy and uh, degraded system which are being degraded it can be re uh, established as i told you it can be measured which type of plant species can have best adaptability towards those coastal areas and what type of models can be prepared to just uh, change the scenario of the of the climate change to which can which can uh, sequester the carbon and what is the estimate of storage and emission for the from the priority areas there are many various types of industries which are being also established on the coastal areas so that they have they they also emit the carbon and eventually they can restore the carbon in the coastal areas restoration of mangrove forest as well as the estuaries because estuaries play a important role they have a, a condition of fresh water as well as of the coastal areas which has a maximum diversity of not only plants but also of the of the zooplankton and other animal sources also estimation of greenhouse gas fluxes and mangrove sea grasses which can have factors which can be influencing it so these are some of the things which can be uh, uh, done in the future for mitigating the climate change uh, and there are various aspects also but uh, as the time period is very much short but i'll be uh, sharing this particular point that we have to focus we have to focus very much concretely uh, before the the earth itself or the globe itself says that yes now i am in danger please help me so before that we have to just go for process of mitigating this climate change through natural sources through sustainability these should be some of the priority of areas which should we should work for the nature in which we belong so thank you very much thank you once again all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my views and share my thoughts re related to the climate change as well as with the weather thank you thank you dr suhas for sharing your excellent presentation so let's move forward with our next speaker mr mauricio santiano casas he is the co-founder and circular innovation director at circulus mexico colombia Mr. Zanteno holds a master degree in civil engineering with specialization in earthquake and climate change risk analysis from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and bachelor's degree in civil engineering with specialization in structural resilience from the Benemeritus Benim Autonomous U University of Puebla. As a member and consultant of the Circular Economy Platform of the Americas, Mr. Zanteno has collaborated as a national leader for Mexico in the evaluation of the circular economy current situations for the development of roadmap for Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and Uruguay, an initiative by CTC and UNIDO for Latin America and the Caribbean. So now I request him to present his views with us. Over to you, sir. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon for you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the organizers, uh, to Sarnish especially uh, for this invitation to be part of this interesting webinar. And uh, I'd like to, to start uh, my presentation uh, talking about the circular city. So uh, how to be prepared for the next coming years in terms of a transition for a sustainable development, but uh, thinking in a new in a new biz, uh, in a new development uh, model that is empowered by circular economy. So uh, I can move forward. So from our context in Latin America, uh, by 2040, uh, we expect to have 90% of people living in cities and urban areas. Currently, we are uh, almost around 
81, 82% uh, people living in, in these urban areas. So the first question before to talk about circular economy is where will all basic resources uh, needed in the urban cities by urban lifestyle uh, come from, no? Because the cities need energy, need water, need uh, food, uh, and so on. And all of these uh, sources are coming from the surrounds, no? Rurality and other uh, context uh, be behind the, the cities. If the people is coming uh, from there to, to these urban areas, who will work uh, to support this development? This is the first question. The second one is, if uh, are we really creating value under a linear economic uh, development model? No, what we know, uh, especially within the last 50 years. Mexico, in, in a specific case, has lost 80% of uh, its rainforest since 1970. No, we are talking about a six uh, massive extinction, not only in Mexico, this is a planetary fact. And uh, Latin America has lost 95, 94% of biodiversity uh, in accordance with a Planeta Vivo report by WWF last year. So this is a critical uh, situation. We are uh, living in a climate emergency and uh, maybe the, the approach now is how to recycle some materials, how to uh, be recovered from post-pandemic, but the climate change is uh, an urgent, urgent issue. This is the first uh, calling no, for today. Uh, the, the third question is if the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 is really achievable under a linear economy approach. In my opinion, this is a paradox because linear economy uh, is the antithesis of what we need in sustainable uh, way. The evidence shows us that uh, a higher purchasing power for people uh, increase the production, increase the consumption, increase the waste generation. So this is uh, clear, no? For uh, citizens coming from high income countries are uh, wasting and over consuming around 25% more than citizens coming from uh, middle or low income countries. So if we need to, uh, to eliminate the poverty on these countries, it means that under a linear economy approach, all these people will require more consumption of uh, natural resources, more waste generation, and then pollution. So this is a big paradox. That's why we need to switch to a new uh, economic development model. We have uh, also, and in different regions, uh, this massive uh, migration. No, uh, One of the, of the central causes are the climate change and the oil uh, inequality, social inequalities associated to that. The, the, the current uh, development model uh, shows us that 1% of people of world population is concentrating the, the, the richness, no? So 90% of people is living uh, behind uh, of this 1% of rich people. So this inequality uh, means now a uh, massive uh, migrant migrancy uh, and we need to hack all this situation. We need to uh, rethink all this development uh, concept and then to take action uh, in consequence. Uh, the value chains, so the industries, are composed by 99% of SMEs, so small business, small companies, and we need to decarbonize in an urgent and in an accelerated uh, path, no? Uh, is not exclusively for Latin America. This is uh, occurring in over the world. So in Europe, I think this is 98% of SMEs uh, powering the, the value chains. We are experiencing a digital and technological transformation. No, we are in the middle of the fourth and maybe the fifth uh, industrial revolution, but it's time to rethink how to use all these technologies in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, enable new uh, processes, more efficient, more uh, clean, obviously, and then uh, more equal for the social development. 
and then uh, we need to to think on the on on how to prepare the next generation, how to ensure resources, how to ensure prosperity for the for the next uh, years. No, because they are coming now. They are in the school. They are uh, maybe taking some decisions and adopting some uh, consumption pathways. So this is the time, the proper time to make decisions. Because if we don't take a, a proper decisions, we won't have time to revert the impacts in the future. So uh, the the fourth question: Is it a sustainable future? No. The the pandemic is just a symptom about this uh, unsustainable. A model that we have uh, everywhere. So the the pandemic is not a matter of every every hundred years. Uh, maybe it will be uh, the new reality within the next fifteen years, experiencing new pan pandemics uh, due to the loss of bi biodiversity. Because this is uh, well linked. No, it's hyperlinked to loss of bi biodiversity. It's not a matter. It's not an isolated matter. So that's why we need to rethink the system to make decisions to conserve and preserve the, the uh, biodiversity in order to avoid these kind of uh, perverse uh, situations. Uh, it's time to uh, change the mindset, to avoid to live uh, in the garbage, in the waste, to uh, avoid to, so to learn from the nature, no, we need people supplying and uh, supporting the development of cities, and these people uh, must uh, find opportunities to to get a better life, no, to to get a fair trade uh, opportunities and, and so on, education and and all of this. Uh, uh, model of social uh, development. So uh, the the planet boundaries are now are very, very close to be to be overpassed. No, uh, I, I want I, I like this uh, quote by Barack Obama, uh, because this is very powerful. No, uh, we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change. But we are the last generation that can do something about it. So every single decision that uh, we cannot take in the proper time. So now uh, we, we won't have any uh, time to revert this impact. So this is the time to make a decision or, 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 or to go for, uh, to take one of these two ways, no? The climate change, the unstoppable uh, environmental uh, degradation or regeneration of systems, a regenerative uh, model, a restorative uh, uh, system. So the circular economy is a quite two-way two -way, uh, strategies, no? In, in one way, we need to decarbonize all the energy system because winter is coming, because we need to switch for new uh, sources, we need to consume energy intensively, not only for industrialization, but also for comfort and, and, and livelihood. We need to create massive jobs because we are in the middle of an economic crisis globally. We need to recover materials because we cannot go for more extractive uh, resources because it means more uh, environmental degradation. We need to stop emissions, so greenhouse gas uh, and methane emissions. And we need to reduce consumption to reduce the water stress and to reduce dramatically the virgin materials processing in the industries. So uh, we have the technology to empower the systems with a clean energy. We have technologies, we have business models to transform the infrastructure and the lifestyle on cities. We need to uh, to start to think in the future in a sustainable way, no? to make decisions uh, from the design of products, from the design of uh, technologies, because this uh, design stage is, uh, is determining or predefining what uh, impacts will have in the, in the near future when these technologies uh, won't be usable anymore. 
we need to change the value chains. No, we need to 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 create new associative models. We need to uh, to support the big corporations, but uh, with a more symmetric uh, system with SMEs and with other players in the in the local context. It's time to regenerate the resources to renew. Uh, all these materials, all, all these resources that we need to, to, today, but uh, ensuring the resources that will be required by the next generation uh, in the coming years. We need innovation. We need to uh, start with research and develop new materials, new solutions, new technologies. And the academy and the, the researching centers are the, the main or the key actor to, to play this role. And then we need, as citizens, as consumers, change our mindset, change our uh, journey, change our uh, uh, pathway of consumption. No, thinking more in the impacts and making uh, better decisions from our own side. And then uh, all logistics today are a very big hotspot. No, and this is the time. This is the symptom that why we need. To, to change the system. It's time to think in a globalization. It means some global decisions, but supporting by local context, by local uh, production, by local chains. How to go from linear to circularity? In the first uh, place is we need to stop the obsolescence of products. We need to stop fast fashion in case, no? We need to stop overproduction and overconsumption required to, to sell of these uh, materials or these products uh, that overpass the, the planet, planetary boundaries. 80% of impacts of a product comes from its design. So we need to redesign all the products, all the services that uh, support our, our lives in, in the cities. No, it's time to avoid to design more under an omelet way. And then how to redesign all products uh, in a logic that we can recover materials, recover components, refurbish them, remanufacture them, and then how to uh, remake new products or to change the lifestyle of the customer no? in a secondhand markets or in uh, avoiding ownership of products uh, with services and so on. The, great, the, the biggest paradox of this uh, current linear system is that we are consuming uh, massively the 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 more elemental uh, resources no in the in the case of water in mexico 70 percent is being consumed by agro industry no but the result of this production is 35 percent of this food uh, become as a waste so i think this <laughs> figure can say everything no so we are uh, spending all these valuable materials and resources that nature is putting in, in, in front of us, but we are converting everything and transforming all of this in garbage, in, in waste. So this is unsustainable. This is the, or these are the, the two phases of the same coin, no? uh, the cities today. The cities thinking from the uh, vibrant metabolism that requires water, that requires energy, uh, uh, materials, uh, products, and so on. And in the other phase, people, people with different needs, people with different capabilities, people that we deserve uh, an opportunity for development, no? uh, more equality and more inclusion. We need sources we need to regenerate the sources to support this vibrant uh, metabolism the current one but if we project for the next 15 years we will need more resources to support this uh, accelerated uh, development we need to understand who is the citizen no what kind of needs uh, has uh, what opportunities is looking for what talent is behind of, uh, of uh, him. So it's time to rethink the cities from the human uh, uh, center approach. 70% of GSG emissions are coming from cities. 
75% of natural resources are consumed in cities. 50% of informal employment are in cities. So we need to make decisions now. But how to transform the cities? We have three ways. The first one is we need to make decisions from the top down uh, uh, flow, no? It means all the structural and systematic uh, structures will change. So I mean, fiscal policy, policies, I mean, regulations, I mean, infrastructure and so on. Maybe this is not in our hands as well. This is not in our decision. It needs a po political will in the, in the main of cases, but we can do, or we can implement a lot of solutions in a bottom-up approach. We need, so we can make decisions as customers, as leaders in our organizations, and re as researchers, as uh, making uh, decisions in, uh, in, the public, uh, in the public administration and so on. And at the end, everything will be implemented in the cities. We need cities with people making different decisions in an in a, uh, individual scale, but also in, the, in a systematic, uh, and a structural uh, uh, level. So that's why the meso, the cities, are the main point of transformation for this circularity. So uh, clean energy means new, new employees, new capabilities, educational challenges also. Uh, sustainable transportation means multimodality, so a change of mindset. Uh, new business models on the on the on the city as as professor alina uh, show us in, in in the first intervention we need data to understand better citizenship to understand better the systems the metabolism and to predict and be more efficient in all administration of sources we need innovation no as the uh, professor su has show us to understand from science what decisions must be taken in the con in the local context, but also in the global way? We need to change the mindset as consumers, no, to prefer good products by quality and not by the the appearance. No, it's time to reduce the waste, uh, changing our behavior. It's time to put the innovation at the service of business to transform, to revalue, to retake some materials uh, classified as waste as our raw materials, no? We need to change our diet or lifestyle. Uh, it is not a matter of be vegan or vegetarian or no, it's a matter to change everybody to make a proper diet, to, proper, uh, to make a proper or to adopt a proper lifestyle in order to be more sustainable, no? In their individual, individual scale. It's time to create mechanisms also. This mechanism to make traceability, to uh, allow products, components, materials to return uh, through reverse logistics and then to uh, reincorporate in, in new uh, industrial cycles. It's time to change the behavior of citizens, no? to change the mindset of people in the streets. It's time to learn from nature because nature is, is a generation zero, zero waste. So we need to understand all these processes and then to, to bring our, our old systems, all productive systems. And it's time to empower others, to empower next generation, to empower new businesses, to empower new employees. We need an urban uh, metabolism under circular uh, approach, but also with an inclusive and uh, equal a balance. It's time to think about the environmental impact, but also in how uh, could be adapted or how uh, would we uh, make decisions for this scenario of climate change for 2030 or, or, or longer than. But in the middle, we need to transform the economic development model because circular economy is an economic issue. It's not only an environmental uh, management issue. That's why if all uh, the approach or all the attention is put on their economic uh, economical way, 
we have an opportunity to create prosperity, to create better conditions of development for everybody and to avoid to uh, leave uh, behind uh, people. And then we need competitiveness, no? We need innovation and we need to uh, make this transition to industry 4.0, cleaner and, uh, efficient, and more efficient as well. It's time to rethink all policies or public policies that can put all the, all the rules uh, to operate and to make uh, development decisions for the future. So it means circular economy. But the big question, how to accelerate the transition towards a sustainable economy? First, we need to think in, in two uh, big boundaries, the planetary boundaries, but also uh, this elemental uh, boundary that no one left behind in social uh, inclusion uh, way. Everybody needs food, health, uh, proper income, peace and justice, uh, political, be a political voice, uh, social equality, gender equal equality, and so on. That's why we need to rethink the systems, to rethink the policies, and to make decisions in consequence. It's time to avoid uh, to think in, a, in, in the planet as a big uh, warehouse of raw materials and uh, switch the mindset towards a regenerative systems because we need new uh, resources to be more productive, but also next generation will need it. It's time to rethink the cities as a vibrant places, as a big opportunities uh, centers, but also we need to think on them as a more human, as a more inclusive uh, spaces. Not more human only because we are more people. We need to be more people, but we need to more human people. So the circular economy is a, it's a, a, it's a full of opportunities. No, we are talking about a circular supply. We are talking about a eco design of products, change or switch from a consumer of some products to a, adopt services to make, create new markets as a second hand markets or revalue of materials markets. It's time to empower people for remanufacture, for re reparation, uh, to, to share, uh, to share uh, assets in order to create value and to retain this value, avoiding to, to leak uh, this value uh, to landfills or, or, to, or to emissions as well. We need to make traceability. It's time to, to get data and to understand with this data, not only the efficiency of systems, but also the needs of people, the, uh, if we can uh, be capable to adapt to this climate change and to have all this information as, a, as a, a starting point for innovation, to develop new solutions, to develop new products and services for the markets. We, we spent, so we as, as, a, as a humankind spent long time uh, thinking in the wrong way, no? Recycling. Recycling is not enough today to, uh, to revert the climate change or to revert the, the current uh, climate emergency. We need to rethink the system to prevent waste, to reduce at the minimum, but also to reincorporate all these materials, components, products to new production systems. We need in the in the in the first approach and in the in the highest level to create roadmaps, circular economy roadmaps. So, what is the route uh, for this transition for an organization, for a sector, production sector, for a city, for a public policy? It's time to get data and to transform or to put in 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 indicators, not only to to uh, measure the the performance, but also to understand the behavior and to understand where are the opportunities of innovation. It's time to understand how uh, productive, how effective or eco-effective are the systems that we have today in, in, in the economic uh, metabolism of countries and cities and how added value we are creating and retaining. 
what is the dynamic of consumption of industries, of people, of uh, production processes, even of public administration or public management systems. And this is the new phase of a city, no? It's, it, it's necessary to get this kind of picture of a city to understand better what is, uh, what is in the inflow, what is in the outflow, uh, because if, if we have no clear what is coming and what is going out, uh, nothing will change. We, we have no information to make better decisions in terms of technological adoption, in terms of a new business creation, new regulations, a adaptation for the coming years and so on. At the end, this road mapping will allow us to make proper action plans and then to establish responsibility and key roles for each actor of the, of the city. I mean, citizens, uh, authorities, academy, and then uh, the private sector. This is a win-win-win approach. If we have a circular industry, we are more competitive as industries. We can find or, or develop new businesses and new markets. We can get this business resilience no? on this scarcity scenario uh, where we can uh, have all, all these resources available as today or as in, in the past years. As, as citizens uh, under a new pathway of consumption, we can create a more sustainable culture to deploy uh, education, to, to deploy new jobs, uh, opportunities for the coming uh, people or for the coming generation. And we can empower or enabling uh, all these prosperity opportunities for all people in the cities. From the sustainable public administration is not only a matter of resources efficiency uh, because it's important, but is also how to get or how to reach these strategic and sustainability development goals. How to attract new investors to our cities or to our uh, territories, and then how to increase the tax collection because this is a very very. Uh, uh, hotspot no this is a very critical hotspot in in this uh, post pandemic era and then we need to think in our economy uh, as a digital and knowledge economy not only as a raw materials or the low added value uh, economy it's time to create a good reputation in organizations, in cities, in, in decision uh, makers based on traceability, but also in innovation processes to transform the systems, to transform the solutions. And we need to build in blocks. No? In, the first, in the first level, uh, the co-design of products and services can empower durability, adaptability to new uh, ways uh, to use, to reduce some parts, components, and materials to repair products, to uh, extend the, the lifespan, uh, this process of disassembly and reassembly in order to be reincorporated to new industrial uh, uh, models or industrial processes. And at the end, and just at the end, to recycle the materials that are not capable to reintroduce to, a, to, to an industrial uh, production. In the second level, it's time to rethink circular business models no? to switch to a digital economy more efficient in logistic uh, in logistics uh, terms but also to empower people to make other uh, services for the circular economy i mean reparation recovery of materials and parts remanufacture uh, refurbishment of products uh, and so on and also the third a big channel is how to close the cycle, no? Close the cycle of these materials that have no more opportunities uh, in the industry as components or as uh, materials. And we need to maybe create new, new ways to, to reintroduce to, to new processes. Uh, industrial symbiosis is a, is a good way to uh, close the loop in eco parks, you no know, industrial parks, where share energy, water, and other kind of flows. And in the in the third level, 
we need to create new structures, new systems, no? Uh, the first principle is uh, no waste, no pollution for all the, the value chain. The second principle is based on a cascade in uh, reusage of all uh, resources available. Uh, what is a waste for a process is an inflow for other for other uh, new process. No, in the in 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 the logic of biomimicry or in the logic of industrial symbi symbiosis, and then in the in the third way is how we we'll regenerate all systems because we can ensure or must ensure the resources for the next generation. And at the end of projects, at the end of operations, what, uh, what are the next steps? And in the fourth level, so we need to reset all these big systematic uh, conditions. The first one, we need to create a circular economy framework, so new rules. Uh, it's urgent and new fiscal policies based on if you pollute you pay more no this is clear uh, it's require new infrastructure to reintroduce materials to reintroduce energy to the systems clean energy it's time to uh, to make a transition uh, towards a digital economy more efficient and uh, more dynamic a big challenge is the education for innovation and then to create new opportunities in the in the in the cities it's time to change the mindset of consumer no uh, towards a more co uh, conscious and then sustainable pathway mm -hmm. the traceability is the first uh, step because we have data or we need to generate data to uh, understand better the behavior and to identify the opportunities for innovation and then it's time to create new instruments, new mechanisms to finance all this transition. No, uh, re the research and innovation requires investment, requires resources in order to be uh, deployed for these uh, projects. So this is not a this is not a plan for short term. This is a long way to make this kind of transformation. This is just a, a, an example that I like to show. Uh, this is uh, Estonia as a society or digital society created since 1996 and 20 uh, years later is uh, giving the next step towards circular economy. So the message behind is we need to make decisions now to think in the long uh, term, but also in the short term, we need to make actions uh, even if the system uh, or the systematic conditions are not the, the proper, we need to start to make new, uh, new sustainable decisions no? in an individual scale. This is a recommendation just for uh, fiscal uh, policies analysis. This is a very robust uh, analysis made in Europe that can be uh, as a starting point for policymakers. And then uh, we can identify also these trends of sustainable product policy uh, that are now in the Europe, but in the in the middle term will will be everywhere. No, it's it's time to adapt our businesses, our value chains to these new scenarios where uh, will appear mechanisms for sustainability. Uh, just to to close this intervention uh, is circular economy can be deployed can be accelerated in three levels the first one to make uh, big decisions no uh, multi-sectorial decisions that require a political will in the micro level we need to start to implement solutions new technologies new business models new uh, production and associative models in the micro level as, a, as individuals as organizations and then everything will be having big impact in the territory, you know? uh, cities, urban areas, in the value chain, or in the communities where we are operating as industries. This is the proper time to make these decisions. Thank you very much. So let's now move forward. Dr. Bharat Maitreya, 
Dr. Bharat is a professor at Department of Climate Change School of Science, Gujarat University. He holds a PhD in botany from Maharaja Krishna Kumar Singh Ji, Bhavnagar University. He was nominated as a member of the assessment committee for the revised merit and normal assessment scheme for scientific and technical staff in Central Salt and Marine Chemical Research Institute, Bhavnagar. So now I request him to present his thoughts with us. Over to you, sir. But uh, first of all, I am thankful to this Nanoland, especially Dr. Rajesh Acharya Ji, Omkar Acharya, Mr. Janes and uh, Ms. Uh, Dave. So uh, I hope that uh, today's uh, topic where this uh, regarding to this uh, future of winters in the climate change era. So uh, I have opportunity to take a webinar series of this uh, international webinars organized by the Nanoland. So uh, this is my the seventh series I uh, joined as a, a speaker and presenter of my uh, knowledge uh, sharing process from this, uh, my academic position as well as this uh, researcher. So, I'm working as a professor in a university, but uh, as a research uh, guide that uh, climate change, then the environment science, bioinformatics. Uh, so these are the various biological subjects where the students, those who are coming to us for their academic and research career. And uh, from the basic part to the, uh, the research era, or maybe in this, uh, like that uh, the in this modern science the new technologies which are involved from uh, laboratory to field work and also for, which are affected to the microorganism to the microorganisms so every day that we deals with the, some content regarding to this uh, science part and also some of uh, this climatic condition portions so here today that uh, I am sharing uh, my uh, some content regarding to uh, this topic which are given today to me. So future of winters in the climate change era. So today's webinar topic, myself, Professor Bharat Maitre. So I am sharing some points where generally the system of this particular science portion where the climates and the, all the kind of this phenomenon which are going on. So most of that part, I'm saying that the every portions where the climatic condition is there or maybe some kind of the weathering process is there. So this is a natural phenomenon. And also some of them which are being uh, these our earth which are being most surrounding to the sun portion. And due to this uh, part of this phenomenon. So somehow we felt a uh, different kind of this climatic condition or maybe weather process in uh, our routine life. So this ocean that uh, these are affected on the earth part where the geographic location is considered, the time of the day is considered, various seasons when we are considered, the local landscape or local weather is conditions. So it may somehow uh, have uh, some differences like temperatures or wind, or maybe some kind of this uh, rainfall process. So we felt that in a different part where the different seasonal variations or maybe environmental condition we are felt. Here, the ocean 
where we talk about this uh, earth part generally it's most surround to the sun and mostly the area where the direct sunlight mostly in this equatorial portions where it are connected so with its portions or maybe this regions become very hot and this in the northern hemisphere or maybe in a southern hemisphere where the direct sunlight is not is covering this region so it's become the having a low temperatures or maybe not having a direct sunlight towards them so the angle of that particularly us on their own axis or maybe more surrounding to the sun which are impact on that various seasonal portion to them mostly that we are saying that the earth which are most towards this uh, surrounding the suns and the also which are on their axis or maybe tilted somehow in a year mostly the 23 degree tilted portion of that part so the different regions which are located on the world which are uh, having a somehow impact of the various temperatures or maybe solar radiation here by this rotation movement for the effect that we felt that day and night is there bulging of the earth at the equator and flattening at the poles the deflection of wind and ocean currents and the tides the apparent movement of all heavenly bodies from east to west so these are the phenomenon where the earth which are most surrounding to sun area or also the tilted part so just talking about this one of the seasons winter that nowadays in india we feel that uh, in a most of this the northern indian regions where the heavy snowfall which are going on nowadays and we felt in this uh, a fog away from these regions in a, our state of our nation gujarat where the, we felt this somehow the uh, cold season now and very cooling atmosphere nowadays temperatures which are just uh, decrease uh, in the way 4 to 5 degrees uh, on last 3 to 4 days so uh, one of the four season like we are saying that the winter spring summer and autumn which seasons mostly in northern hemisphere the winter spring summer autumn season generally it start from this uh, 21st december up to the uh, june part most of this uh, seasons portions in the northern hemisphere that we feel but also the vice versa that in the southern hemisphere that if there are the cold position or winter position in northern hemisphere so there are the summer position in the south hemisphere on the earth part which felt uh, likewise this uh, our country india that uh, i say that the mostly we having this winter spring summer and monsoon season of that four season in our nation and also apart from that uh, a different as a traditional season portion like in uh, gujarati i said that vasant grishma varsha sarad hemant and shishir like the spring summer monsoon autumn pre winter and winter seasons we have so uh, we felt each and every seasons uh, different environmental condition around us the coldest time of the years that we have felt at uh, we said this is winter the days are shorter and the nights are longer that we are saying that this is winter so winter comes after autumn and before spring winter been begins at the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere the winter solstice is usually in december 21 also in a summer portion at the southern hemisphere winter is the coldest season in the year that this is it is characterized by falling snow and freezing cold temperatures usually exacerbated by strong winds the season which usually last about 3 month is caused by the winter striking area being farthest away from the sun in the earth's orbit around it 
the sin comes where this uh, in morning and then when it uh, does not uh, hot during this uh, season mostly the most of the people those who have this by this weather report during this winter having proper pro protective clothing and freezing to the dead the, on some particularly severe occasions snow and strong wind has blocked roads and grounded flights even frozen river for days week and months so these are the uh, natural phenomena during this winter seasons which we feel mostly the plants and animal life respond to in, in varying ways There's some animal such as birds migrate when the winter season is approaching and only return during the summer this is to ensure food supply as most of their food sources freeze in the winter others go into the hibernation a state resembling sleep where the animal remains inactive usually housed in a shell remaining so until summer arrives some animals profusely gather and store food in preparation for winter months when the sources are dead and gathering impossible in response to the weather most animals have also adapted themselves by developing thick furs that keep them warm during this seasons others such as the snow shoe hare changes color to white and becomes indistinguishable from the snow as a survival tactic the earth snow and this various parts where the snow and the ice can easily change between solid and liquid state in response to relatively minor changes in temperature so this reduce the snowfall and less snow cover on the ground could diminish the beneficial insulating effect of snow for vegetation and wildlife while also affecting water supply transportation cultural practice travel and recreation for millions of people for communities in arctic regions reduced sea ice could increase coastal erosion and exposure to storm threatening homes and property while throwing ground could damage road and buildings and accelerate erosion such changing climate condition can have worldwide implications because snow and ice influence air temperatures sea levels ocean current and storm patterns whether we are thinking about this in winter seasons and the we are talking about or maybe discussing about the snowfall then glaciers and then ice so the arctic sea ice antarctic sea ice ice age glaciers lake ice great lakes ice cover ice break up in rivers snowfall snow cover snow pack permafrost freeze thaw conditions so these are all these terms and terminology which we are having or maybe some kind of this knowledge about this in this particularly cold season like winter here the observation where this global average temperature had risen by around 1 degree centigrade since pre industrial time so emission of greenhouse gases aerosols and changes in land use and land cover during the industrial period have substantially altered the atmospheric composition and consequently the planetary energy balance and are this primarily responsible for the present day climate change the warming since the 1950s has already contributed to a significant increase in weather and climate extremes globally like that heat waves drought heavy precipitations and severe cyclones change in precipitations and wind patterns including shift in the global monsoon systems warming and acidification of the global ocean melting of sea ice and glaciers rising sea levels and changes in marine 
and terrestrial ecosystem. So these are all these uh, phenomena which are mostly which are dependent on this temperature rise and fall. So global climate model project, a continuation of human induced climate change during the 21st century and beyond. If the current greenhouse gases emission rates are sustained, the global average temperature is likely to rise by nearly 5 degrees centigrade and possibly more by the end of the 21st century. Even if all this commitment, which called this nationally determined contributions made under the 2015 Paris Agreement are met, it is projected that global warming will exceed 3 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. However, temperature rise will not be uniform across the planet. Some part of the world will experience greater warming than the global average. Such large changes in temperature will greatly accelerate other changes that are already underway in the climate system, such as the changing pattern of rainfall and increasing temperature extremes. So generally, when we are talking about the nation, India's, India's average temperature has risen by around 0.7 degrees centigrade during 1901 to 2018. So most of the approximately 120 years to go in the past years that we felt that the mostly the temperature uh, which are being are increased. This rise in temperature is largely on account of greenhouse gases, induced warming, particularly offset by forcing due to the anthropogenic aerosols and changes in land use land cover. In the recent 30 year period, temperatures of the warmest day and the coldest night of the year have risen by about 0.63 degrees centigrade and 0.4 degrees centigrade respectively. By the end of the 21st century, these temperatures are projected to rise by approximately 4.7 degrees centigrade and 5.5 centigrade respectively. Relative to the corresponding temperature in the recent past, it is in response to the combined rise in surface temperature and humidity. Amplification of heat stress in expected across India, particularly over the Indo-Gangetic and Indus river basins. In the Indian Ocean warming, the sea surface temperature of the tropical Indian Ocean has risen by 1 degree centigrade on average during 1951 to 2050, since last 65 years to go, where this sea surface temperature, which are risen by 1 degree centigrade. During the 21st century, sea surface temperature and ocean heat contained in the tropical Indian oceans are projected to continue to rise. Here the some of these oceans where I notice or maybe some kind of part where this changing in rainfall, that the changing in this Himalayas where they, we felt that the most of the glaciers in the northern eastern portion of our Indian region, then the drops then sea level rise, tropical cyclones, the flash flood, flood, then heat wave, landslide, severe local storm, and tropical cyclone. These are the natural calamities which are mostly, uh, which are affected uh, by these calamities uh, also impact on this uh, weather and climatic or maybe environmental condition at that part. The balance of scientific evidence suggests that there will be a significant net harmful impact on ecosystem worldwide if global main surface temperature increase more than two above pre-industrial level, where the climate change affects birds, change in temperature, changes in precipitations, greater climate extremes, ecological synchronomy, bird seasonal response and shifting, egg lying dates, migration timing, mismatch between behavior and environment. Here they also the some kind of this uh, natural phenomenon or maybe 
uh, rising in temperature or maybe global warming practices. So somehow the natural calamities or maybe anthropogenic activities, anyhow, the rise and fall down these uh, temperature portions. So over time, by the last many years, it's increased. So also it uh, have uh, impact on the plants, where the plant where we having some kind of this as far as the concern with the environmental part, the mainly this two condition portions in this uh, particularly physiology of the plant where the photosynthesis and respiration circles. Also this light energy, which are absorbed by these uh, cells of this particularly in this plant part and uh, where the releasing this oxygen uh, during this uh, photosynthesis activity and absorb this carbon dioxide. Also, we generally are taking oxygen during the respiration and also releasing carbon dioxide during the night period or dark period. Also, it is manufactured the uh, carbohydrate, the simple carbohydrate from the uh, particular food as the primary producers. So tree which are having as a main important role in that portion. So due to this climate change, then the cold acclimatization, freezing tolerance, then cold deacclimation, gene regulations, metabolisms, plant hormones, plant signaling, photosynthesis, photooxidations, photoprotection, proteomics, transcriptomics and water relation winter hardiness and many more this physiological activity which are due to this uh, particularly environmental changes or maybe weathering process or climate changes which are uh, impact on that or affected to this plant life. Also when we are talking about this some monthly climatology of minimum temperature or mean temperature, maximum temperature or precipitation from 1991 to 20, the 30 years data where we are having. And this is the particularly in this uh, month where this uh, from January to December, when we uh, see that from January to May portions that uh, increase in this particular temperature and others uh, contained. And also this uh, June, July or August, uh, the most of the part where they felt that uh, more than the 40 degree uh, centigrade were temperature which are risen in that particular area. And then suddenly in this uh, month of this October to December when the winter uh, seasons where this also decrease, uh, these all fall down this temperature in the particular portions. Here they present the annual anthropogenic emissions over the 2015 to 2100 period, showing our emissions trajectories for carbon dioxide from all sectors uh, for a subset of three key non-carbon dioxide drivers considered in the uh, scenarios, methane or nitrous oxide or maybe sulfur dioxide there. So these are the rise and fall or maybe some kind of this uh, particularly GHGs uh, portions where this anthropogenic activity which are affected on this uh, rise and fall down of this temperature or maybe global warming process. So climate change where the high and low temperature part is there. This indicate described trends in unusually hot and cold temperature across the uh, US and area of this continuous 48 state with unusually hot summer temperature which are in this 1910 to this 2020. So more than 100 years, uh, which have we have a data uh, regarding to the some part of the, the on the earth. So where the, we are saying that uh, this already after the 1950 or 60s, where the urbanization or maybe industrialization process, where the temperatures uh, uh, which arise or maybe arising portions. Uh, where this uh, always in increase order of this particularly portion. Also somehow this average annual natural hazard occurs for 1980s to 2020 means 40 years where we are saying so most of the 
portions where they are the wildflower, maybe drought, earthquake, then epidemic, then extreme temperature, flood, landslide, miscellaneous accidents, storms. That these are the all these uh, particular natural hazards which are uh, affected to this uh, environmental portion where this uh, either it is a weather part or maybe climate change. So somehow it's by being man made or maybe naturally these hazardous things which are impact on that particular portions. The key natural hazard statistic for 1980 to 2020, where we are saying then from 1980 to 2020, here, the average annual hazard, which are occurs for this, always been the rise of that portions. So most of the portion where we have to some kind of this mitigation of particularly natural hazards, or maybe some kind of phenomenon, if, if we are protecting ourselves or maybe some part of our region or beyond the earth. Here, the climate change knowledge push portal where we are seeing here, the average temperature from last 120 years. So we say that uh, here clearly is in this particularly graph showing that this uh, from that 1971 to the 2020, 20, so up to this level that always this uh, temperatures which we are uh, rising or maybe some kind of increase in the temperatures. Here, the climate change indicator high and low temperature where we are discussing that in the daily highs or maybe daily highs hot part or maybe daily lows or daily lows in hot in small person, small portion where they from 1910 to 2020. So here with graph shows that this part uh, which are been uh, increased uh, in year by year. Here, the, in the condition of this winter or maybe spring or maybe summer or maybe fall autumn. So we are here saying that from 1890 to 2020, so more than 100 or maybe one, more than 100 years data which we have. So we uh, feel that uh, there by this result that which we have. So we say that uh, day by day or maybe year by year or maybe coming years. So you know, every year these temperatures which are been arise or maybe increase and will be in future. So most of the portions where this uh, consider in every seasons on us. So we felt this uh, temperature will rise. So these are the condition in the our uh, Indian uh, regions where you can see in here. So the temperature portion is are being uh, fluctuated or variated uh, during these various seasons portions. So at the current climate of this India, which are saying context for the current climate of Gloji, so 1991 to 2020 derived from the observed historical data, information should be used to build a strong understanding of current climate condition in order to appreciate future climate scenario and the projected change. You can visualize data for the current climatology through spatial variation, the seasonal cycle or as a time series. So analysis is available for both annual and seasonal data. So these are the simple where I, uh, uh, collect this all this data from that portion and say that uh, this particularly in this uh, winter season also this after the winter so there are the summers or maybe monsoon autumn and then again this winter season is come but uh, as per as i'm thinking or maybe from this basic science uh, which we have studied or maybe some kind of climatic uh, change or climatic condition environment science or maybe some kind of atmospheric science which we have studied. So last uh, from many few years, last of uh, very few of these uh, agreements of this various uh, by this national or international seminars or conferences that we felt that uh, the most of the part of this our on the earth regions, either by this uh, melting of this ice or glaciers, sea level rises, or maybe increase in temperature, also the uh, man-made or maybe anthropogenical or industrial, this greenhouse gases is increased. Global warming is uh, considered, then ozone depletion is considered. 
so natural hazard is also there so these are the role where this all these uh, which are arise or arising of the temperature portion or increase the temperature so during that parts and nowadays uh, from last two, two, two or three days that uh, we did in the newspaper that most of the arctic regions or maybe some kind of glaciers during that this summer's uh, melting processes are there and also the shrinkage of that particular region in that particular part where this uh, uh, every year the rising of this temperature so anyhow this if we are maintaining this our uh, earth temperatures uh, not uh, rise or not increase in much more so uh, we felt that uh, during this uh, century that we have this uh, normal conditional seasons all of that so uh, winter is there but it is not in a very cold very very cold winter which we have we have summer but it is not a very very hot summer to with us so each and every seasons in this moderate portions if which are been uh, falls down so uh, as a intellectuals as a researchers and is as a uh, people of the, our each and every country that uh, it is need that uh, we have to think about that and uh, we have to conserve all those things and as a particular intellectuals or maybe as a learners or maybe as a teachers that we give uh, some kind of this uh, content to the all this our next generation that uh, we have to maintain our the environment also some kind of this has other things so we have to mitigate earlier and uh, we felt that uh, this kind of these portions or maybe some kind of this uh, talk or maybe webinars which are beneficial to us so uh, thank you again thank you nanoland so giving me this opportunity thank you Thank you very much, sir, for an amazing presentation. So now we have been listening to our eminent speakers deliberated in the areas of climate change since all. All this valuable insight gave us a new perspective that one should adopt in their practice. Encouragement, enthusiasm, excellence. That are the major aspects of this webinar. So coming to the question and answer session of this event, I now request our patiently listening audience to put forth their questions before our esteemed speakers for the desired answer. The very first question is for Dr. Alina. How to measure the global gas emission through satellite technology? Oh, yes, thanks for that question. Um, that's just quite a technical one. I'll do my best to answer that, but also understanding that, um, that people here have got quite different experiences of it. So in the past, we've mainly been monitoring carbon dioxide to get an overall picture of what things are like in the atmosphere. And that's why the monitoring stations are in quite remote locations, places like Hawaii, where they're not so affected by, by, by man-made sources or also even seasonal changes of, of the vegetation and trees. So to get those overall long-term pictures of climate change, that's why we have those remote monitoring stations. But more recently, we've seen some quite exciting changes where technology has improved and through satellite tracking, we can see to a much finer grain of detail where sources are emerging. And one, in, one interesting thing that came out during the, the Glasgow Climate Conference with COP was a major announcement that the, the European Space Agency is collaborating on a new initiative that will enable people to see specific point sources of pollution. So they'll be able to see specific um, factories or large emission sources of CO2. And that will be very useful in governments and other agencies tracking their, their carbon emissions and being able to, to manage and control and report on, on their carbon. So I'll, I'll put a link to that European Space Agency thing in the chat. I'm aware people have got very different levels of technical background <laughs> on, on this call regarding that. So I hope that was fine, um, but happy to perhaps follow up on more, more technical or, or specialist points in, in the chat too. Uh, yes, I would like to add uh, one point uh, along with uh, Dr. Elena. 
uh, as the question uh, determines about the the, the technology for uh, calculating or measuring the gases right the, I would like to add that thing that uh, through remote sensing, there are various literatures which can be uh, seen for uh, calculating or measuring the green, different greenhouse gases, in fact, maybe methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide, which I had shown in my slides. So all these gases have different frequencies, different wavelengths, which can be captured through the remote sensing and which can be measured. So, so that will be a, a good technology or which is being developing technology to measure throughout the globe, what is the scenario of uh, different gases which are emitted. Uh, through the pollution. Yes, thank you. Sorry, you're on mute there. We didn't catch that. Uh, Jalashri, you're, uh, you are mute. Okay. The next question is for Dr. Bharat Maitreya. What is the permanent solution of the greenhouse effect? Uh, mostly these uh, activities during the like this anthropogenic activity or maybe uh, some kind of this uh, nat uh, the natural hazards. So if we are to mitigate them, because when the production of these greenhouse gases is uh, more and more, so which are impact on this uh, all these uh, biological organisms too, also the physical and chemical composition which are on the earth, not only on the earth surface, but the atmosphere also in the underground level portion also. So the which if we are maintaining the each and every the uh, cycles of the ecosystems and uh, which are sustained this uh, particularly normal gases, uh, it, it is produced by the industry or maybe others somehow. But if uh, we are maintaining them, so we can also uh, not uh, have the more greenhouse gases in that portions and that we are uh, uh, low down this uh, environmental condition or hazardous condition from that. So greenhouse gases which can be maintained by this uh, all means. Uh, Dr. Alina would like to add something. Yes, yeah, just briefly to add something in um, a question in the chat from yeah. Vishyati Patel about why we're able to predict local conditions. And the map I showed of the UK, where it got those little dots, the one kilometer squares, that's because our, our meteorological office and our environment agency conducted a large and rigorous research program. <laughs> so we, we have some degree of certainty about what our climate will be in 2040 and 2060. And a lot of researchers spent, spent a lot of time, a lot of money producing that data. So other agencies like public authorities, and universities can, can draw on that data. And I appreciate we're very fortunate here in the UK to have that data set that many other countries don't have that level of detailed knowledge about how climate change will impact on their localities to inform public policy. Even within that, there is still uncertainty. So we don't know how quickly we'll act together collectively to reduce emissions. So some of the uncertainty comes from not knowing how quickly we will together take political practical action. But some of the uncertainty also comes from the climate models as well. But we shouldn't take that uncertainty to mean we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> we know what's going to happen within, within certain limits and we should plan around those. It's not that we're uncertain about climate change being real and being a serious threat. So the uncertainty shouldn't, shouldn't be viewed in that way. Dr. Suhas would like to add uh, to the question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Alina that there are uncertainties about the climate change, but it's it's fact that uh, we need to uh, go ahead and find a concrete solution regarding the uh, mitigation of the climate change, yes. The next question is for Dr. Alina. How to measure the global gas emission through satellite technology? Oh, I think we've already sort of done that one. I think we're I think we're okay with that. But if people have got really specialist technical questions on that, we'll perhaps put them in the chat and we'll we'll try and do those. The next question is for Dr. Suhas. What are the solutions to climate change? 
uh, yes, I had answered in that question chat box that uh, the, the solution is, is from the source itself, that is maybe through the vehicle transportation or maybe through any of the technological development, what we can uh, through different industrial processes. For example, we can say that industrial process works on a proper, proper uh, procedure for manufacturing something, right? That can be modified, that can be sustainably uh, built up towards the advanced technologies, which can which can maybe minimizing the, the pollution or or the pollutants uh, but not actually as a natural uh, way so we should we should go on the natural uh, sustainable way for uh, mitigating this uh, pollutions in the uh, in terms of planting the trees but as elena uh, referred in the chat box that it should be in a proper management or manageable way which cannot be uh, damaging the, the the natural ecosystems and perhaps if I could add, add on to that, I completely agree, but also that there isn't one simple solution. So climate change is what we call a wicked problem. It's not something where we can do one or two technical things and solve it. So it's, it's perhaps different from some other challenges we've faced, like the hole in the ozone layer a few years ago, where we could bring in a few specific measures to certain things. So we could stop aerosol gases, we could change refrigerants, we could change insulation materials. And through those three or four things, we could solve that problem through, through technical measures and regulation. Climate change is much different from that. It's what we call a wicked problem. And that there isn't just one or two technological changes or behavioral changes we could do. It's, it requires system-wide change. And that, that there isn't, <laughs> unfortunately, just, just one or two simple things we, we can do immediately to solve it. The next question is for Mr. Mauricio. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can is, you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Is the economical economical conditions of the certain country are the major obstacles in gaining the environmental goals for underdeveloping countries? Oof, uh, this is a quite complicated question because you know some conditions are given. But I think uh, the, the most important thing to do now is to align all sectors in a, under a, a common vision, and then it can catalyze the, the political will. Because technology to, to uh, so technology to decarbonize the systems are ready. No, uh, the financial resources maybe are not there. But uh, in the recent couple of, of years, are um, are uh, emerging a lot of instruments, a lot of organizations giving financing for these kind of projects. So we can we can reach the the financing. Uh, the regulatory framework is not ready, but in some specific uh, areas or industries, uh, some laws or some norms are being uh, performed no? in Colombia, particularly the uh, EPR law uh, since last year is making some uh, interesting uh, changes uh, in some uh, packaging and, and some logistics uh, value chains. But I think the, the main issue is to change the mindset. The people is not understanding the, so how critical is to make decisions now uh, the climate crisis is uh, advancing rapidly and the uh, scarcity of materials is, is coming and nobody is uh, uh, aware about. So I, I think this is a matter of, of, uh, of awareness, of mindset, and to align properly the, the will, in my opinion. The next question is for Mr. Tokozani. So. Uh, how to control global warming? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, there are so many ways. Uh, there are so many ways in which we can uh, tackle uh, global warming, and specifically through mitigation and adaptation. Um, 
uh, one of the uh, greatest ways of tackling uh, of controlling global warming, for example, here in my nation, is by uh, controlling the deforestation. Because uh, I understand in 2018, uh, Malawi was recorded to be uh, having the highest deforestation rate in Southern Africa. So it means for us the biggest challenge is to control the to, to control deforestation and. Uh, it would be good for us if we, if we would prom be promoting more of our forestation projects. Uh, and another thing is by 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 making sure that uh, 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 green uh, green energy sources uh, are, are affordable. Because I understand that though we are telling people not to use charcoal, not to use firewood for fuel that we have to make sure that uh, electricity is affordable because if you don't provide affordable electricity, it means even though we are restricting people from using charcoal, they would still be uh, finding uh, ways to still use those illegal, illegal sources of energy. So uh, currently, I should say that the government of Malawi is really doing a great work by promoting uh, green energy sources such as solar power and recently the president the head of state of the nation of Malawi just opened the a power plant uh, in, in, the, in the district where I stay in in Salima uh, it is a mega power so, so solar station whereby they're producing electricity which to really contribute a lot to 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 providing energy to the nation so if uh, projects like these are promoted it means that green energy sources are going to be affordable and if they are affordable it means people uh more people are going to be uh they're going to run away from 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 using harmful energy sources so uh i should say global warming is can be controlled that uh, we have to promote uh, mitigation measures and uh and adaptation measures so that's my opinion thank you so much with your permission, I would like to add uh, something to what uh, Tokozani is saying. Uh, I would like to state that it is really very difficult to control global warming at the pace at which uh, the mankind is living at this stage because you see a new industry developing daily. So to control that uh, production or the industrial uh, wastage or pollution uh, and over that global warming is being uh, you can say affected by several reasons it's not just the pollution that we can blame it's uh, uh, the solar radiation is taking place and uh, over the over that the natural phenomenon uh, uh, making the earth move towards uh, the global warming so you cannot just uh, blame the mankind pollution, no doubt the pollution is creating an issue and is creating global warming, but that itself cannot be blamed. So there are several things which is not under control of mankind. And uh, yeah, it's uh, what I feel personally, it is very difficult to control global warming at the pace at which the earth is moving right now, the human race is moving right now, you see different technologies and for that the manufacturing and everything takes place at a very large scale so it's just uh, i think not possible in a way to control what is happening around the globe you cannot impose your restrictions on each and every country on each and every uh, province or state in different countries so yeah that's uh, something i wanted to add I mean, I mean, clearly global warming is happening and it's real and it's with us and we can't go backwards, but it's where I guess we go forwards. So um, how we make sure in, in the future that we don't we don't leave our children and our grandchildren with a world they, they cannot live in. Yeah. So to, to go forward realistically, but, but also hopefully about, about how we can develop um, in future that, that doesn't harm the, the chance of future generations for for them to, to grow up in a world where they, they can bring up their families. Maybe we'll be adapting to a new climate in the future. <laughs> You're a mute, Janashree. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Elena. How to measure the global gas emission through satellite technology? 
Oh, I think I've already done that one. But if people have got particular questions, I'm happy to put those up. Uh, I left my email in the chat if people would like to ask it. So thank you, everyone. So let's move forward. I now request Mr. Zarnesh Kanojia to appraise this gathering with his vote of thanks. Mr. Zarnesh Kanojia works as a chief scientific analyst at Nanoland Limited. He is a postgraduate in climate change impacts management from School of Science, Gujarat University. He mainly focuses on research generally associated with climate geography, biodiversity, glaciers, and climatic wildlife. He is also a filmmaker, a wildlife photographer, and a nature lover. So now I request Mr. Zarnesh Kanojia to deliver a vote of thanks. Oh, thank you, Jalashi. So good evening everyone uh, and let me introduce myself. I am Zarnesh Kanojia and work as a scientific, uh, sorry, chief climate analyst at Nanoland. I am honored to present the vote of thanks for today's international webinar on behalf of Nanoland and the entire fraternity of this organization. <clears throat> I extend my hearty gratitude to all the speakers for placing their important work and sharing with us their research and opinions today on future of winters in the climate change era. I want to extend my gratitude to Mr. Omkar Acharya, Scientific Advisor at Nanoland, for welcoming our speakers and providing his constant support in organizing this international webinar. <clears throat> I would like to extend my appreciation to Dr. Bharat Maitre, Professor at Department of Botany, Bioinformatics and Climate Change, Mr. Thogozani Mashire, Co-Founder and Programs Coordinator, Youth Action for Environmental Management, Malawi, Dr. Alina Congreve, Associate, Local Government Information Unit, London, Professor Dr. Suhas Vyas, Professor and Head, Department of Life Sciences, Bhakta Kavi Nurse <coughs> Mehta University, Junagadh, and Mr. Mauricio Zendano Casas, Co founder and Circular Innovation, Innovation Director, Circulus, Mexico and Colombia. We have been fortunate to have renowned identity from academics, industry, and other areas. And I would like to take this opportunity to place on record a hearty thanks to Xavier's Research Foundation, LD College of Engineering. U.S. India Importers Council, U.S. IIC, Youth Action for Environmental Management, Circulus, and ICFI Law School, Hyderabad, for co-organizing this international webinar and making it a success. Uh, we are grateful to Waste Major, Razor Aqua, Amqua, Rotary Club, Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite, and HK India for sponsoring this event. I take this occurrence to thank the entire committee as well as the audience for presenting their valuable views and without whom this webinar would not, have, would not have been possible. Taking everything into account, I should thank all of the individuals who have upheld us directly or indirectly in the smooth working of this webinar till the end. We have planned such interesting webinars in the future too. We, uh, we need your full participation in that. Uh, thank you everyone, this is much appreciated. Thank you, good evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Zarnesh. In closing, I wish to express my gratitude to all the panelists and participants for their full cooperation. It offers me a chance to commemorate our success in pursuing excellence in the field of climate change. We are privileged to have in attendees such distinguished experts as well as observers. Having such resourceful insights and researchers who have helped us to gain valuable insight about our changing weather patterns due to climate change. With this, we sum up our session, wish everyone to stay home and stay safe. Thank you for jo joining, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you all. Happy weekend. Thank you.